Blum has won this ball game. What a night for Jeff Blum. And he smacks one into center field. A game-winning hit for Jeff Blum. Welcome back to Baseball Quoting. I'm Corey. I'm joined today by Jeff Blum. Jeff, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us today. Um, you were drafted in, in 94 by the Expos, kind of came up through their system and then played uh, three seasons with them. I know recently there's been talk about kind of reviving the Montreal franchise and bringing baseball back to Montreal. What was your experience playing there? And uh, do you think that baseball should come back to, uh, to Montreal, Canada? I actually enjoyed playing in Montreal. You know, it, it was unique playing in, in uh, Olympic Stadium. I know that the, you know, the knock on Montreal and that stadium was is that uh, we always had some pretty good teams, competitive, and we never drew enough fans. And that's always going to be the biggest issue whenever you think about getting back to Montreal. Are they going to be able to draw enough fans to make having a team there sound feasible? and convince somebody to, you know, ownership to buy a team and, and make it work up in Montreal. And I think that it could work if they, you know, did something a little more intimate along the river going through Montreal right there, because it's, it's just a great town. It's, it's incredibly diverse. You know, it's got the French speaking uh, atmosphere around it. So it's got this European kind of feel to it. And then, of course, you've got the rabid uh, hockey fans that are around there. And I think there's one season that is missing up in Montreal, and it's uh, the summertime. Because summers in Montreal, a lot of people will uh, tell you they're phenomenal. And why not have a ball club out there to enjoy the climate and enjoy the people? So at the time I was playing up there, I absolutely enjoyed it. And it wouldn't hurt, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if it was back in the rotation and we got to go on some road trips up there. Yeah, do you think kind of an outdoor stadium would be better suited there, or was the dome kind of a necessity? Um, you know what? It's funny you ask that because there were times where, you know, we'd be, uh, as Americans, we'd be celebrating Cinco de Mayo up there, and I'd put my beer in a, you know, a frozen snowbank outside <laughs> my apartment, and that's a little scary at times. But, you know, Minnesota's got a similar climate, and they're doing pretty good with an outdoor stadium so I think the way Minnesota has approached it and taken on the challenge of having an outdoor stadium I think it opens up the opportunity to say that Montreal might be able to function with an outdoor stadium so it brings in a little bit of the elements but uh, most ballparks across the country do in different ways. Yeah I feel that's one of the more unique things about baseball is kind of stadiums are the same yet different there's all these little interesting kind of quirks and, and nicks and crannies to them and Kind of going off that a little bit, your time in, in Houston, you got to play at a Minute Maid Stadium kind of right when it opened the first couple of years, you know, with Towels Hill. <laughs> Personally, I, I enjoyed Towels Hill and the difficulty up there, but what was kind of, I guess, a, a player sense or even some of your teammates who played center, center field, did they enjoy it or did they find it kind of a hassle? Um, you know, when it was kind of split down the middle, I know that, you know, to the eye and now that I sit in a booth and call games, you know, to, to your eye and aesthetically, it looks kind of cool to have that hill out there. It, it gives you a little bit something to talk about. And then the flagpole was in place. So it was kind of an homage to some of the older ballparks mm -hmm. uh, around the major leagues as teams were growing up. And I thought that was kind of cool that it kept some of the nostalgia of it. And, you know, there's some center fielders that hated it. There were some guys that loved it. I know most hitters hated it because it was such a graveyard out there at 436 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And But it led to a couple of interesting plays for Lance Berkman, Craig Vigio. I remember, I think it was Rob McCobiak that made a phenomenal play out there one time too. Um, but, you know, it was always in play. And I actually played in the game where uh, – Sexton hit one off halfway up the flagpole and it stayed in play and it ended up being a triple. But if the flagpole wasn't there, it might have been about a 475 foot home run. So, you know, it lent itself to some interesting times and and some quirks. But it's also interesting now without the hill there, how few home runs we actually do see out of center field, even though it's, you know, moved in a good 25 feet. So uh, from the looks of it, it looked great, but uh, I think it's a little bit better now just because it allows more seating and more fans to come in and see the ball game, and it hasn't really had much of an effect as far as balls going out. Yeah, I can only imagine how frustrating it is. You really get a hold of one, and then you <laughs> see someone camped out under there, or on the contrary, you smoke one off the uh, one of the light posts and you end up at like second or third base, and you're kind of like scratching your head like, oh, that's that's out pretty much everywhere else. 
Yeah, it was kind of funny to see Richie Sexton's uh, reaction as we were relaying the ball in. But it's funny to watch the video, too, because the ball goes out there. Me and Adam Everett, I was playing second base at the time. Mm-hmm. And we just kind of give it the, the courtesy jog because we know the ball was crushed and it was probably yeah. going to go out. But all of a sudden, it ricocheted and came back in play, and we went into full panic mode. <laughs> kind of panic mode for everyone. Everyone's like, oh, we actually got a <laughs> – we have a play here instead of, you know, a souvenir. Yeah, for exactly. Yeah, that's what it was. Um, kind of – 2005, you start out in San Diego and then get traded midseason to to Chicago. It's kind of the only time you were ever traded um, during the season. I guess what's what's that like? Kind of being told, "Hey, you're thanks for everything, but you're kind of you're, we moved you out, we moved on." Yeah, that was an interesting situation because mm-hmm. I, you know, playing in San Diego, it was near my home. I grew up in Southern California, so I had a lot of family and friends that were at games, and it was a very comfortable environment for me to go out and play in. And then what made it even better is that we were a very good team and we were winning the West uh, in first place. And it was a rare situation where a guy got traded from a first place team to a first place team. Mm -hmm. And I actually moved into a better situation with the White Sox being 15 games up. But, you know, around that trade deadline, you know, there's certain guys that know they're not going to get traded. And then there's other guys that are on that kind of question mark, you know, could could I be moved or Mm – you know, is, is this the time where I've got to pack things up? And I got the tap on the shoulder and, you know, it kind of broke my heart in a way because I was in Southern California and I had, you know, my wife was uh, just giving birth to our triplet girls and I was pretty happy being home and being available. And then, you know, I get shipped off to Chicago and I've got to meet a whole new group of guys. But thankfully, you know, it was a situation where Ozzie Guillen wanted me on his team and I came in, and to the credit of every guy that was in that White Sox re- uh, uh, clubhouse, they all came up to me man by man and shook my hand and said, we're glad you're here. So that really made the transition that much better for me and really made me feel welcome. And, of course, you know, things turned out the way they were. So mm-hmm. the baseball guys were watching out for me in 2005. Yeah. And then kind of going from, you know, Padres to White Sox, White Sox win the pennant, you end up playing in the World Series – that kind of postseason, you get, I believe, a pinch hit at bat in the first game of the ALDS. Mm-hmm. And then you're, don't see real life pitching for a good three weeks and you get thrust into the uh, kind of the World Series in the 14th where you hit that, that famous home run. I guess when you get that call to kind of hit again, we, what's going through your mind? And are you a little bit, you know, rusty up there? Are you a little bit concerned? <laughs> yeah, there's always a little bit of concern when you've got 21 days in between <laughs> at bats. Uh, you know, but thankfully, you know, but between the, the ALCS, when we beat the Los Angeles Angels or the Anaheim Angels, whoever they were at the time, and we have time in between the ALCS and the World Series, mm-hmm. we actually had a chance to face our bullpen quite a bit. We were doing simulated games in between as the Astros were trying to beat the Cardinals. So we got a chance to see some live pitching, which was great because, you know, they're going full speed. We had a chance to really keep our eyes and our timing down and uh, trying to stay engaged in that sense. And it was kind of paramount that we stayed in shape, you know, myself, Pablo Ozuna, Willie Harris, and Chris Widger, because we knew in the World Series, we had the first two games at home, which are American League rules. And then we knew we were going to head to Houston where we were going to play in National League rules. And that's where you kind of heighten your awareness and understand that there's going to be the opportunity for double switches. There's going to be opportunities for pinch hitting. And, you know, then we end up in game three and it it takes four, what, 13 innings to get me in the ball game. But uh, timing couldn't have been better and it couldn't have been a more magical situation for me to step up there. And what's crazy is facing a team that I played for, you know, just a year removed. Yeah. When did the kind of, magnitude of the situation or kind of what you did kind of hit you I'm guessing during the moment it's all kind of a blur but then what when did you kind of realize like I just had a go go ahead home run in the World Series yeah you know what I I love it I get this question and you framed it really well because Mm -hmm. you don't really realize it until everything's done because you get locked up in the motion in the in the moment and I knew I had a 2-0 count and I knew Ezekiel Estacio's you know the one pitch he could throw for a strike consistently was a fastball so I was sitting on it Turns out he misses a spot by a good foot and a half and kind of throws it in my happy spot and I turn on it. But you're right. After contact, my initial reaction was get to second base because there were two outs and I wanted to be in scoring position for Joe Creedy and Aaron Rowan behind me. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I look up and I see the ball bounce in the stands, everything kind of went quiet. And I remember high-fiving Tim Raines 
And I remember reminding myself not to fist pump or bat flip or freak out because a lot of the guys in the other dugout I was very good friends with and I didn't <laughs> want to disrespect them. Yeah. But to this day, I do not remember touching first, second, or third. I remember high five and Joey Cora around third, but I remember also getting to home plate. And as soon as I hit home plate is when I felt, you know, the energy of the ballpark kind of surround me a little bit. And I think I high fived Aaron Rowan and my mom, my wife, and my brother were up in the stands. And that's why I blew the kiss. It was kind of like, you know, just a, a great big thank you kiss for everything that they, they allowed that, that, that they sacrificed to have me on the field. And then you go through the elation of high-fiving your boys and thinking about winning a game. And there's a shot, if you watch the actual game footage, there's a shot that's about maybe two or three minutes after I get in the dugout. I'm taking off my batting gloves, and I kind of take this deep breath. And I look up at, the, like, the roof of the stadium, and I just say, wow. <laughs> and that's when it really kind of set in that, yeah. uh, you know, I had an impact on a World Series game. Yeah. And – can only imagine it's every kid's dream right there. World Series game on the line. You end yeah. up being the hero. And then you guys go up uh, 3 nothing, and then take it home, you know, the next day. Yeah, no, it was literally, you know, I wasn't lying when I did my post-game interviews. And I said, I've had this in bad in my backyard with my younger brother about 350 <laughs> times. I never thought it would actually happen. You yeah. know? So you react a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yes, it, it was very much a dream mm -hmm. come true for sure. Yeah. And I know today's uh, day and age with the new uh, runner on second rule changes and even the <laughs> DH, that, that you probably don't get to that point. It's probably over, you know, well before that. Um, going off that, are you a fan of the new rules or are you kind of the old school approach? Man, you, you know what? At first, I, I, I understand – I should say I understand the concept during this season because there's only 60 games – uh, the rosters are pretty thin. You've got to protect your pitching. So I get the fact that that's why the rule is in place because they don't want to extend these games into 15 to 18 innings and, and burn through pitching that you're going to need to get through the short season. So I understand that and I respect that. But at, at the same time, I'm not a fan. And I actually had the chance last night uh, with the, when the Astros played the Dodgers, mm -hmm. they got tied 1-1 and you know, the, the craziest thing is to watch a guy go run out to second base without doing anything. And that, you know, that's my first instinct yeah. is like, how did that guy earn the right to get to second <laughs> base when, you know, they just say, go out there. It's all, you know, it's, again, it's like being out in your front yard and telling your guys, okay, let's pretend ghost runner at second base. And that's <laughs> kind of what it felt like to me. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, of course, as, as luck would have it, we go about 12, 12, 13 innings before the game is finally finished. But you know what? I'm not a fan of it. I think it puts a little too much pressure on the pitching. And, uh, you know, then all of a sudden you get in a rut where you're not driving runners in and it affects your runners in scoring position, batting average. And then one of the craziest things that really kind of kind of made it funky for me was when Rios for the Dodgers hit a mm -hmm. leadoff two-run home run. Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as my partner Todd Callis said that, I kind of dropped my pen and I was like, What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that that one really lost me. But uh, yeah. I get it, but I don't like it. I, I can't see this happening moving forward. Yeah, the first uh, leadoff two-run home run in, in Major League history. <laughs> yeah, dubious <laughs> honor. Yeah. That's crazy. It's unfortunate that uh, it came against the Astros, though. I know. Well, hey, I mean, the way things have been going lately, it kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of going into your broadcasting career, you kind of went f pretty much from – player retirement almost directly into broadcasting was that always your plan to kind of finish up your playing career and go into broadcasting or did you ever want to do coaching oh man I wish I could sound like a genius and say yeah I, I wanted to go into broadcasting and everything worked perfectly but uh, I, that was not the the option I was looking for to be honest you know to your point a lot of my contemporaries and a lot of my ex-teammates were moving into the front office they were moving into coaching you know Brad Ausmus, Mark Loretta Mm -hmm. You know, even Baggy uh, to a point was, you know, advising uh, with the Houston Astros and, you know, uh, Lance Berkman, he was still playing, but he knew he wanted to get into coaching. So the, the idea was to stay in the game somehow, because when I talked to guys that had, that had retired, whether they were in the game or out of the game, you know, I said, what was your plan? And every guy said, every single one of them, whether they were in the game or out of the game said, if you want to stay in the game, find a way to stay in the game. So that was my mentality. I knew with four kids and a, and a moderately good career, I knew I needed to continue to earn and support my family. So 
my idea was how am I going to stay in the game? And I was comfortable trying to sell myself as a front office guy. I was comfortable trying to sell myself as a scout or a coach. Um, it would have been a grind, but at the same time, you know, I was fortunate to be available to the media throughout the course of my career. And a lot of people, you know, said, Hey, you know, J Jeff's a good interview. He's a good sound bite. You know, what if, you know, would you think about it? And in 2012, when I retired, the mm -hmm. Diamondbacks actually gave me an opportunity to do two games in September after I got released in 2012. So I said, you know what? I would love to. You guys are still paying my contract anyways. I might as well uh, earn a couple bucks that I still have left yeah. on it. <laughs> and uh, I did two games and they went terribly. And I talked to Tom Candiotti and he gave me some great advice, you know, just call the game. And, you know, I don't want to get too in depth on that, but he did a great job of kind of giving me an idea of how to handle broadcasting. And then in 2013, lo and behold, Jim Crane's owner of the uh, Astros and he wipes out uh, the radio uh, personnel that he had. Bill Brown, the, the full-time mm -hmm. voice of the Astros, was uh, pulling back and only doing home games. And Jim Deshays, the color analyst, moved to Chicago with the Cubs. And I kind of told my agent, kind of joking, I'm like, hey, man, give me an interview. I want to get my name out there and see if anybody will, will bite. Yeah. And I took the interview in about four and a half hours. I got on a plane and flew back to California. And about a month later, I got a phone call from the president, team president at the time, George Apostolos. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, are you interested in working only the road games? And I said, hell yeah. And now here we are. I'm working full time for the Astros. And I couldn't be more grateful or happy about the opportunity because I absolutely love the game. And I love the fact that I get to sit and watch the baseball every day. Yeah, it's got to be kind of dream come true, kind of go from playing right into, you know, watching, being able to stay connected to the, the game you love. Um, I know prepping for a baseball game as a player, you know, there's, there's batting practice, fielding practice, a couple hours of, of prep beforehand. I guess what goes into preparing, you know, a broadcast for a major league baseball game? Uh, another great question. I love these, you know, and I'm glad that people out there want to know these answers because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not exactly easy. You know, my job is much easier than Todd Callis's or Julia Morales. Mm -hmm. You know, Julia's got to get underneath and, and get the interviews and get the insight. Uh, Todd Callis has to get all the numbers and make sure his facts are correct and, and be ready to, you know, pronunciate names correctly and make sure he has all this, you know, the numbers ready. And I'm more of the guy that supplies the stories or the anecdotes and some of the analysis on what's happening inside the game. So my preparation is a little bit different than theirs. But at the same time, I still try to have an idea of the team I'm covering, the mm -hmm. opponent they're playing. And if I see something in a swing or if I see something in the momentum of an offense or a pitching staff, I try and figure out what that is. And then I try and marry an analytic or a statistic to it to help tell the story because baseball is interesting that, you know, the statistics can really tell a story. And mm -hmm. I work for an organization now that is hyper analytical. So I try and convey some of, some of that to the fan at home too. But, you know, there's about two hours before the game where we actually have a production meeting where we talk about some of the graphics we want to go over some of the replays or some of the highlight film that we want to uh, employ during the broadcast. So it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to kind of get us all in the same room and have an idea of what we're doing. But it's, it's a lot of communication be mm -hmm. between the producer, uh, myself, Julia, and Todd. And I'm, again, very lucky to be working with two other great people that uh, provide a great deal of support when we're calling mm -hmm. games. And correct me if I'm wrong. You always have an like, earpiece in. you got producers, and I'm guessing a couple of <laughs> statisticians does that ever get a little confusing trying to focus on the game your conversation with Todd or Julia as well as the producer in your ear absolutely and that was probably <laughs> one of the bigger adjustments because that's not something they sit down and tell me you know mm -hmm. Todd knows it because he's a pro Julia knows it's because she's a pro I'm just the ball player that sits down and puts the headsets on and, you know let's call a game guys <laughs> and you know it took me a good two years to really understand how to be you know, concise in what I wanted to say so that we could get through some of the highlights and get to commercial breaks. But uh, it took me a good while to really understand that when they started to count down in my ear, how mm -hmm. to end a sentence appropriately and not sound like a complete buffoon. But uh, there's also moments where TK is trying to, you know, have a conversation with me and the producers in my ear telling me what's coming up. And it's, it's extremely tough to kind of listen out of both ears. 
Yeah, I'm guessing you got it down to a science now, but those first kind of that first year, those first couple of games are probably just a, a shock to you. Yeah, no, and I'm really glad. You know, it's kind of funny. We always joke about it, Julie and I, because we broke in together. 2013-14, mm-hmm. we basically had zero ratings. The team was bad. Our our TV deal was awful. There weren't mm-hmm. many homes that were seeing the games. And I always tell Julie, I'm like, thank God, because it was a real learning curve for me to try and figure out what was going on and find my voice and find out how to work behind the scenes with what was going on. But now I feel like we're a pretty well-oiled machine. Yeah, you went from the uh... – kind of the 13, 14 Astros, which were, it struggled a little bit to the, obviously the height and the reign and the dominance and kind of going based on the, the 2020 team, I guess the, the biggest news is the, the loss of Verlander. I guess, how do you think the lack of not only, you know, physical play, but kind of the, the veteran presence in the locker room is going to hurt that team? Yeah, there's a couple things right there. And I think you nailed it. It's, it's one thing, you know, he's a leader and mm-hmm. he's a leader in the sense that he's vocal He's a leader in the sense that he goes out there and works hard and leads by example. And he's a leader because he's, you know, basically pitched himself in a legendary status and potentially Hall of Fame status with his numbers he puts up. So there's a lot of eyes on him outside the game. And there's a lot of eyes inside that clubhouse who watch him and, and use that leadership to motivate themselves to a greater standard. And I think that's where, you know, you're going to see the impact on the field, obviously, when you don't have that guy out there, because there is a certain level of comfort knowing that when you show up that day that there's going to be a guy like Justin Verlander on the mound Mm -hmm. and you don't have to go out there and score seven or eight runs. You can maybe score three or four and be able to scratch out a win because he's going to pitch. Um, I would imagine he has a pretty heavy impact on the bullpen too. When you're in the bullpen, you know he's going to go seven innings at least, it feels like, every time he's out there. So he's going to be a huge loss. And I think that's where the Astros' offense is right now is understanding that that loss and that rotation affects – both the rotation and the bullpen. So as an offensive player, I think they're putting a little more pressure on themselves to go out there and think that they have to go out there and score seven or eight runs. That can be a, that can be a daunting task against big league Mm -hmm. pitching. Yeah. It's gotta be kind of nice. I know the Astros do have a lot, I think I'll correct me if I'm wrong, 11 or 12 rookies or guys with not a lot of experience on the roster. Good chunk of those are are pitchers. I mean, you have, obviously Zach Greinke and, and Verlander on the team, two very distinct personalities, but just kind of being able to, as a young arm, you know, watch them work, watch how they do to prepare, kind of all that stuff. You can only imagine how much you know, knowledge and just, you know, information they can take in just from watching them work every day. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of cool because, you know, you've got Verlander and Granke and now Lance McCullers is, you know, he's basically mm-hmm. a veteran on this team now because you're right about the number of rookies that are on this roster, not let alone what they're in uh, the pitching staff. But you've got Verlander, who's a high powered arm, you know, mid 90s to upper 90s, got power crew ball, power slider. Mm-hmm. And then you've got Zach Granke, who has a little more of a finesse touch to him with movement, uh, changing a speed. So you actually get a pretty cool dynamic between the power pitcher and the finesse guy that goes out there and still puts up phenomenal numbers. And you can learn something from each of those guys, if not try and, you know, put two of those guys together and figure out how you can be a power pitcher and have the ability to locate, which will only make these guys better. But being around greatness usually, you know, has a positive impact on some of those younger guys. Yeah. I can only mean, as you said, I mean, Verlander and and Grant, are probably two of the best ever till the rubber. Imagine those two in the, the same rotation, you know, being able to learn from them would probably be a incredible experience for a young pitcher. Yeah. And you know what else? It makes our job in the booth a little bit easier too, <laughs> knowing that you've got some great history with yeah. those guys and you get to watch, uh, to watch them go out there and do their work. Yeah. I mean, both the times, every time they tell the rubber, I can only imagine like something great could happen tonight, especially with Verlander. Oh man. Yeah. We found <laughs> that out. What was it? September 1st last yeah. year when he went through mm-hmm. his third no hitter. That was amazing to see in person. Yeah. Um, could you ever tell, I guess, when he's when someone's starting that just they have it and it's going to be one of those days? Yeah. And, and gosh, again, we got uh, we got so blessed last year to have Verlander and we had the one and two in Cy Young's. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what's amazing to me is that it was basically it was a coin flip between Justin Verlander and what Garrett Cole did last year in an mm-hmm. Astro uniform. But yes, you can. You can tell when guys have it and you can tell, you know, not only with the way the ball jumps out of their hand or the way that they might be, you know, locating a slider at a high velocity with, you know, some crazy tilt, but it's also their demeanor because I feel like in that first inning, the way, you know, sometimes the way Furlander would come off the mound Mm -hmm. and he would kind of, 
he'd have a little bit of that strut about him and you'd be like, okay, he knows he's got it. And that mm-hmm. would, that would just strike fear in the other team. Yeah. And then you've got a guy like Garrett Cole, who's pumping a hundred miles an hour and dotting it on the outside corner. And there would be moments where he would, you know, the last pitch of an inning throw 98 on the outside corner and he'd be walking off the mound before the umpire could even, even raise his right arm to get the strike three call. So yeah, those moments are a lot of fun to see that happen. Yeah. I mean, that rotation, those three Cole, Verlander, Granke, oh. even that must've been so much fun to just kind of be like, Oh, this is what we get to watch every day. Yeah. Spoiled rotten calling the game <laughs> with my feet on my desk, just you know, enjoying the show, man. Yeah. Um, Last kind of thing we have for you. Um, has there ever been a, a quote, a motto, anything that you've kind of touched on in your, your playing career and life or something you've always drawn inspiration from? Um, inspiration. Um, I don't know about inspiration, but there was uh, – Jeff Cox was my manager in AAA, and this is going to sound odd and, and totally uninspirational. But, uh, you know, I was struggling a little bit at shortstop and trying to play third base. I was trying to learn how to play third base. and. I had made a couple of throwing errors and I was just, my hands were hard and he pulls me off the side. And the greatest piece of advice I ever got was you've got more time than you think. And I know that Mm -hmm. sounds crazy in a sense because uh, athletes always talk about the game speeding up on them. And it was really starting to speed up on me in my, in my triple a year in 1999, the year I got called up, but that piece of information gave me so much peace for whatever reason that I knew that I could feel the ground ball and I could take, you know, if I did everything appropriately, I could take my time and make a strong throw across. And it kind of, and it kind of snowballed into my at bats and it kind of snowballed into the different positions I played where I never really panicked. And that's one of the things I learned that panic, you know, sometimes can create anxiety that will create remorse and you'll regret the move you made. But understanding that I had more time than I thought because my mind was moving so much faster than the actual game itself. That's where I would put myself in trouble. So knowing that I could slow things down mentally, focus on the baseball, focus on the footwork, catch the ball, make a strong throw across. All of a sudden I became a little bit better ball player. And that was really the year that I I broke through and figured out that I could play in the big leagues. And of course it ends up being the year I got called up. But uh, I wish I had more, you know, more insight into an inspirational quote or, you know, uh, something from Vince Lombardi that I I relied on. But uh, there was really nothing like that. It was just the fact that I knew that I could slow things down a little bit and control the game a little bit more helped me moving forward. But, of course, when you get to the big leagues, all of a sudden you feel like you can do anything. Yeah, sometimes it's all it takes is something to kind of, you know, slow your heart rate down, slow yourself down and kind of realize, like, hey, I can actually do this thing. No, that's a great point because, mm-hmm. you, you know, you, you, if you slow your mind down, it does slow those other things down. You're exactly right. Yeah. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. No, it's great meeting you. Yeah, and I appreciate what you guys do on Twitter, man. So I, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity yeah. to come on your podcast. Hey, of course. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun kind of uh, researching all the quotes, all the material and kind of putting it out there. Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's amazing how much is out there. and You guys do a good job with it. Yeah, thank you, Ruma. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, Thanks again, Jeff. Uh, Have a good one. Stay safe out there. Thank you. You too.